Well, our Bible reading this morning uh, comes from 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, starting at verse 29. And we're going to be jumping into a new sermon series uh, looking at the life of the prophet Elijah. Uh, so 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, I'll start reading at verse 29. In the 38th year of Asar, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Hael of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sigub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Amen. Let's pray uh, before we look at this text together. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you that it is powerful and active, and we pray now that through the working of your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us, and that we would be changed uh, as we look at this passage together. Amen. Well, Adolf Eichmann was one of the Nazi architects of the Holocaust. Uh, he was caught in 1960 and he was brought back to Israel for trial. Uh, he was tried and found guilty and he was executed. But during his trial, something really interesting happened. In order to prosecute Eichmann, they had to find witnesses who had actually seen him commit these terrible atrocities in the death camps. And one of the witnesses who came forward was a man named Yahiel Deneur. Deneur came in to testify, and as he walked into the court and saw Eichmann in the glass booth, Deneur broke down. He, he fell to the ground sobbing. It was, it was pandemonium in the court, and the judge was calling for order. It was very dramatic. And sometime later, uh, Deneur was asked in an interview why he had collapsed. Was, was he overwhelmed with painful memories or with hatred? The nurse said no. And then he said something that no one expected, quite shocking. This man, who had been tortured in one of Eichmann's death camps, said that he was overcome by the realization that Eichmann was not some demon, but was an ordinary human being. The nurse said this, I was afraid about myself. I saw that I am capable to do this, exactly like he. Today, as we jump into a new sermon series, we find ourselves stepping back into a dark moment of human history. It's a dark moment for the people of God. And we might be tempted to skim over this kind of unfamiliar part of the Bible and the evil people who we meet in these pages. But God wants us to slow down and pay attention to them. He wants us to stop and stare until we are ready to echo the words of Deneur. I was afraid about myself. I saw that I am capable of doing this exactly like he. Uh, we're going to meet some fascinating characters as we look at the story of Elijah over the next eight weeks. We're going to meet a wicked king and a faithful prophet and a useless idol and a living God. And through the drama, God is going to warn us and challenge us, uh, but he's also going to encourage and comfort us. So come with me and we will get stuck into it. We've got two points this morning and the first we're going to look at is the slippery slope of sin. 
the slippery slope of sin. See, our passage starts in verse 29. We're told that Ahab becomes king of Israel. But if you look closely at that verse, you'll notice another king is also mentioned, King Asar of Judah. And why are there two Israelite kings in Israel? It's important that we understand what's going on here, so we're going to have to rewind for a bit. Stay with me, I promise it will be worth your while. You probably remember King David. He's about a hundred years before this, and he was the bee's knees. He was the man after God's own heart. This one big kingdom of Israel, one great king under one true living God. But eventually David got old, and so he passed his kingdom on to his son Solomon. And Solomon was the wisest and wealthiest king in Israel's history. He built this awesome temple for God. He loved God. Everything seemed to be going great. He had an insane amount of gold. Um, He doesn't know what to do with it all, so he basically starts using it like cling wrap. He wraps the temple in gold. He wraps his coffee mug in gold. He wraps all his soldiers' shields in gold. This is the golden age. But a few years later, All of that will be gone. And Israel will be plunged into the dark age. The golden kingdom will be split into two kingdoms with two kings, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Why? Well, it starts going wrong in 1 Kings chapter 11. This is what it says. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. That's important. Pay attention to it. Foreign wives leading the king away from God to worship other gods. How does God respond to Solomon? He says, Solomon, you have not kept my covenant. And so I'm going to tear this kingdom away from you. It's going to be split up. And the line of David and Solomon, they'll just keep one tribe, just Judah, and all the other 10 tribes of Israel will form a new kingdom. This is a tragedy. This is God's way of saying, if you want to be a great king and a great kingdom, you need more than gold. You need to be humbly dedicated to me. And Solomon, if you can't do this, then I'm going to start another kingdom and give them a chance to do it. And so we have the new northern kingdom and we have high hopes. How's it going to go? Well, in the chapters just leading up to our passage today, We're told how it went. Uh, We're given an overview of the kings in the north. Uh, Maybe you want to take a list of some baby names as we go through these. Jeroboam. Good guy? No, he does evil in the eyes of the Lord. Nadab. Good guy? No, evil in the eyes of the Lord. Basha. Good guy? Evil in the eyes of the Lord. Elah. Evil in the eyes of the Lord. Zimri evil in the eyes of the Lord. Omri, evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then we come to our passage, verse 29, Ahab. What about Ahab? Well, as we come to Ahab, we come to a turning point in the book of 1 Kings, and the narrative is going to slow down and it's going to zoom in on Ahab because God wants to speak to us and show us something about the slippery slope of sin. What does our text tell us about the slippery slope of sin? Let's make some observations. Observation one, sin is normal. Look at this line of kings, one after the other. Evil, evil, evil. It's not one or two people occasionally getting it wrong. Sin is the default setting of humanity. And we're talking about God's people. We should never think that we're immune to the dangers of sin because we're religious. Not only is sin normal, but observation two, sin is poisonous. Things aren't just bad in Israel, they are deteriorating. Look at verse 30. 
Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Evil is growing like a poisonous weed. In verse 25, Ahab's dad Omri got the award for most evil king. And now in verse 30, Ahab takes that award from him because Ahab is a whole new low. Observation three, sin is deceptive. See, if you visited Ahab's kingdom, you may not come away from it thinking, oh, what a terrible kingdom. In fact, the history books tell us that Ahab's kingdom was really quite impressive. There was military strength. There was prosperity. Through his wife Jezebel, he enjoys this trade deal where his neighbors uh, help the economy to boom. And so if you had to go to the polls tomorrow, you might vote Ahab because things are going well, aren't they? Or are they? Look again at verse 30. Ahab did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Sin is deceptive. To us, it may look like progress and prosperity. But in God's eyes, it's a different story. I wonder if that's a warning some of us need to hear living in in prosperous Australia. In verse 31, we're told that Ahab considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. What sin is this? It's the sin of worshipping God by bowing down and sacrificing to a big golden calf. That is an insult to God. What a terrible sin. But we're told that for Ahab, it's trivial. You think that's bad? (laughs) You see what else I can do. Far more serious is the fact that he marries Jezebel the daughter of a foreign king. If we remember Solomon's mistakes, we might have little alarm bells ringing in our heads. What's going to happen when Ahab marries a foreign wife? See if you can pick it up as I read these verses. He also married Jezebel, daughter of Eth Baal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal and that he had built in Samaria. Do you, do you get it? Baal is not just this little idol that Jezebel hides in her suitcase and smuggles through Israelite customs. No, Baal is a foreign religion, and Jezebel is the passionate cross-cultural missionary. And you can guess the result. Ahab, the king of God's people, starts worshipping and serving Baal. And not just privately, This becomes the state-sponsored religion. He builds a temple for Baal. This is like Scott Morrison saying, from now on, Australia's national religion is Hinduism, and then he uses taxpayer money to build this big temple right next to Parliament House in Canberra. What's going on with this interest in Baal? Why do Ahab and the Israelites want to worship Baal? Well, Baal was the god of storms, and fertility. Uh, He was often pictured holding a lightning bolt in one hand with a voice of thunder and the name Rider of the Clouds. Baal was in charge of the rain that made your crops grow. He helped you get pregnant. It sounds attractive, doesn't it? He sounds like a friend worth having. And so Israel decides to add a bit of Baal to their lives. And they add an Asherah pole too, which also was meant to help with fertility. They won't get rid of Yahweh. Of course not. They'll just supplement him a bit. Observation four. Sin grows slowly. For most of us sitting here this morning, it's unlikely that we will wake up tomorrow and decide in an instant to just throw God out of our lives. Far more likely is a slow drift God gradually becomes less meaningful. Maybe church starts to have its issues and life doesn't quite go as planned and our faith isn't making the difference we thought it would. And at the same time, we start to become drawn to how people around us are living and we start thinking that life might be better if we worked on the house instead of going to church and train for footy on Tuesday nights instead of going to growth group or watch Netflix instead of reading our Bibles or moved in with our girlfriend instead of marrying her. It's a slow drift. We don't just leave church all at once. We don't just throw God in the bin and put him on the street for collection. No, we, we sit him on the shelf. 
where he gradually gathers dust while we pursue other things that seem more promising. And so as Ahab leads Israel closer and closer to Baal, they cannot help but move further and further away from God. Observation five, sin is ultimately about rejecting God. Have a look at verse 34. It seems like a random verse plonked in there for no reason, but it's actually an important case study of just how bad things have gotten. Ahab wants to strengthen his kingdom, and so he sends this guy called Heal to go and rebuild the city of Jericho. It sounds harmless, it sounds sensible, except that years before God had said this, Joshua 6 verse 26, Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild the city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. Which is exactly what happens to Heal. God mysteriously takes the lives of his sons. We, we don't know how, maybe sickness. What is the point of verse 34? Ahab is now openly defying God's word. He ignores God's curse. He removes a pile of rubbish that was meant to remind Israel of God's salvation and of the danger of being like the other nations. And Ahab snubs his nose to God and his saving work. That is where sin leads. God becomes a little less relevant. Then he's ignored and forgotten until eventually he is openly defied. Where are you on that trajectory? Could it be that you're drifting from God? Perhaps without even realizing it. Is your life starting to look indistinguishable from the unbelievers you know? Could it be that those little sins in your life that you're happy to live with are not as harmless as you think? I wonder how often you actually think about your sin and confess it to God. Could you name five big sins in your life right now that you're concerned about, that you're working on? And what about our church here at Riverbank? Has it ever crossed your mind that we could drift over time? That we could gradually stray from God, perhaps by worshipping Him in false ways, or not staying faithful to His Word, or being so preoccupied with our finances and our building and everything else that we fail to live out His call to be a light in the world. Sin is a slippery slope. And the first readers of 1 Kings knew this well. Because they were God's people, but they weren't living in God's land anymore. They were refugees, exiled hundreds of Ks from their homeland, paying the price for their sin and wondering what hope there was of ever returning. That golden age of David and Solomon, it was a distant memory. Surely there was no hope now. Surely their sins were too great. Surely they had insulted God one time too many. Well, that brings us to our second point. We've looked at the slippery slope of sin. And now we want to see the undeserved discipline of God. The undeserved discipline of God. Chapter 17, verse 1, almost gives us a jump scare. It's so sudden. The doors of Ahab's court, they just swing open and in walks this strange man wearing a hairy cloak and a belt. We're told that later. Who knows who he is or where he's from? And he just walks in, struts up to Ahab and says, As Yahweh, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And then he turns on his heels and he walks out. <laughs> it's bizarre, isn't it? I mean, who is this guy? We're told he's Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead, but scholars don't even know where that is. Elijah appears out of a hole in the hedge. He doesn't have a resume. Does he have a wife? Does he have kids? Did he go to uni? Who does he barrack for? We simply aren't told. And that's significant. It's significant because God doesn't want us to focus on Elijah. Elijah is a prophet 
And the job of a prophet was to speak God's words. It's so important that we understand this. As we start the series looking at Elijah, we need to realize that Elijah is not the hero. God is. These stories aren't about Elijah mostly. And the application isn't mostly be like Elijah. Elijah's name tells us this. It means my God lives. Elijah's whole purpose is to remind Israel that God lives and Baal is worthless. And as Elijah bursts onto the scene, this is precisely what we learn. The God of Israel lives and speaks. We've already seen some clues of this in our text. Verse 30, God saw all the evil. He knows. Verse 33, God is angry. He cares. Verse 34, God's curse comes true, even though Ahab ignores it. God is still in control. And now in verse 1, everything comes to a head. God confronts Ahab. He throws down the gauntlet. Surprise, I'm still here. Look at what God says. I'm the God of Israel, not Baal. And I'm alive, unlike Baal. And I'm going to prove it to you. How? By sending a huge drought. No rain ever, unless I say so. And not even any dew, so that absolutely nothing can grow. Why does God send a drought? Well, remember what Baal's specialty was. Rain and fertility. By turning off the tap, God is declaring war on Baal. He is about to undermine that useless idol that his people are trusting in. He's going to prove that he controls the very thing that Baal is supposed to control. And there's also a second reason why God sends the drought. He does it to remind his people about his covenant. This beautiful commitment between God and his people where God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And back in Deuteronomy 11, just before Israel entered the promised land, God promised his people that he would bless them with rain if they loved him and obeyed him and stayed close to him. But he also warned that he would send a drought if they abandoned him and worshipped other gods. And so God here is giving Israel a wake-up call. He is warning them that he won't tolerate their evil. But in his patience and mercy, he isn't destroying them. I've called our second point the undeserved discipline of God. God's discipline isn't undeserved because it's cruel and unfair like an abusive father. No, God's discipline is undeserved because it is far more patient and gentle than we deserve. We deserve eternal punishment immediately, yesterday. But instead, God graciously invites us back into covenant relationship with Him, which is what Jesus announced when He appeared out of the blue even more dramatically than Elijah's arrival. The Son of God walking the dusty streets of Galilee. Listen to what Jesus says, Mark 1, 15. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. The King has come. The promised King who would descend from the line of David, a righteous King, not like wicked Ahab. A king who was tempted by Satan and didn't sin. A king who does not lead us away from God like Ahab, but leads us to God. A king who isn't concerned with foreign gold and foreign girls, but is concerned with saving his people, even if it involves suffering and dying for our millions of sins. A king who doesn't punish us, his disloyal subjects but ushers us into a kingdom of eternal treasure, a kingdom where at long last God's covenant will be fulfilled. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And so friends, the time has come to repent, to believe. Repent means to turn to Jesus and stop living for ourselves. Believe means to trust that Jesus has done everything we need to be saved. 
what are you waiting for? What have you got to lose? The Word of God, the Word of Jesus exposes our sin and it challenges our idolatry. You think money will make you happy. God says money will grip your heart so that you become work-obsessed and greedy, never satisfied till the day you die and lose it all. You think a happy marriage and family is all you need. If God is not first in your life, you will look to your spouse and your children for your whole sense of worth and love and you'll crush them with your expectations. You think popularity and friends is all you need. Your self-esteem will ride a roller coaster for your whole life. You will never have inner peace or security. God's Word, it shows up and it shows us how stupid it is to build our lives on anything in this world. And here's what I want us to see. Isn't God gracious to do this? Isn't this loving? To show us the foolishness of our idols so that we have time to slam on the brakes before we go careening off the cliff to our certain death. Today, through His Word, God has come bursting on to the scene of your life with a warning and a welcome. He warns us Sin is serious. You cannot two-time God. He demands total commitment. He wants all of you. But God also offers a welcome. He wants you back. And He has sent His Son to pave the way. Some of you have tasted God's beautiful restoration. His his gracious discipline as as He exposes your sin and and called you back and, and healed you. What a blessing. Praise Him for that. I promise you, as you come to God today through Jesus, whether for the first time or the 300th time, you will not find, I told you so, or shame on you. You will not find a drought or a famine. You will find waves of grace. Your sins washed away oceans of love. Let's pray together as we finish. Lord God, we don't often like to stop and think about sin and yet we admit that we need to because so easily in our lives we drift, Lord, we drift from you. We are so easily distracted by this world, by idols, by selfishness by other desires by even good things that that take too much of a center stage in our lives and lord we thank you for your word today which calls us back and shows us and exposes to us the danger of our sin thank you lord that you discipline us thank you that you sent jesus to call us back to show us the way to be the way to take the price for our sin on the cross so that we can be forgiven and restored, that we can be your people and you can be our God. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.